in my 10 minutes, I just want to talk a little bit about Hepworth's library, um, which we were really lucky to have on long loan at the Hepworth Wakefield for several years. Um, and I was lucky to work on and um, curate a small display of in 2017, which some of you may have seen. Um, and I just mentioned we also had uh, a public programme alongside that, and it's lovely to have people who spoke, including Monty and Helena, um, here again today. Um, so I just thought, actually, for this 10 minutes, um, I would just really use it to introduce some of what I feel are really interesting um, volumes within, within Hepworth Library. Um, so first of all, I want to say a little bit about the significance of um, reading for Hepworth. Um, and I put up the quote from Hepworth to Ramsden. And in both her kind of correspondence and published writings, we get sort of references to reading. Um, there's one where she says, I detest a day of no work, no music, no poetry. Um, so uh, reading then is something that she speaks in connection with, with carving, as in the letter to Ramsden, but also as, um, in part, as part of other creative, da creative daily activities, which she sees as really part, part and parcel of her whole work, um, including, including music. Um, also, reading is something that is um, undertaken both as a private activity and something in a more shared capacity. So um, what I found really um, interesting about looking at surveying the library is that it was a, a sense of what came through was not just the individual books themselves that were significant, but the networks underpinning the library um, and the way in which this provided a glimpse of Hepworth's intellectual, intellectual stimulating world and one which I believe is really crucial to the development of her own work. So um, many... I'm just going to go through, and here's a couple of pictures of her, um, just so we can see the library. Um, many of the books in Pepworth's personal library were gifted from friends, often sent with letters, and many contain written inscriptions um, or dedications. Um, relocating to St Ives from London on the outbreak of, of the Second World War, um, written correspondence became really vital for Hepworth to main communication and continue conversations with her previous networks. Um, and so it's interesting to think about that reading forms part of this continuing correspondence series that we get with um, a lot of previous Hampstead friends. Um, and interestingly also to think about the fact that in Hampstead, the nature of her networks was one that was um, predominantly quite interdisciplinary with figures like scientists like J.D. Burnell and Solly Zuckerman. And this kind of model of, in, of interdisciplinary friendship was something that she kind of continued throughout life. Um, later on, the importance of musicians such as Prior Rainier and Michael Tippett. Um, and these friendships in themselves um, across disciplines were also key to the development of her book collection, both through the texts gifted or recommended and the inclusion of those authored by friends. So in the library, there's a lot of books by people like Herbert Reed, there's some by J.D. Burnell, Solly Zuckerman, um, uh, Frank Halliday, the Cambridge, um, sorry, the Shakespearean, Shakespearean historian, and um, Dach Hammarskjöld, uh, the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations. Um, sorry, I just lost my bet where I got to. Um, therefore, these networks um, came to dictate, come to dictate both the library scope and its subject matter, with disciplines ranging from literature to music, philosophy to science, politics to religion. Um, and there are moments, as I mentioned earlier, about the idea of shared reading, um, of reading the same text and multiple multiple friends, often reflecting wider cultural and historical moments of particular interests in um, specific texts or authors. Um, so I just yeah, think it's key to really think about the library in terms of the relationship between both people's subjects and books. Um, so, and um, what I think the library can do is um, provide a spotlight on maybe some of the different figures in Hepworth's life. Um, who perhaps haven't been thought about so much. So here we've got the um, composer, Priya Rainey, who became a really important friend to Hepworth um, in the 1950s. And one of the interesting things about the library is I realised that Rainey gave, Rainey gave Hepworth a lot of books that a lot of them weren't about music. Um, 
and it really and uh, made me realize that actually thinking about that relationship it wasn't just of just about music it actually goes much further um, and the book uh, I have on the slide here is a copy of Rilke's letters um, which Rainier includes um, a piece of paper with her particular reading suggestions tucked in in the margins and as we know um, Hepworth was reading Rilke both with people like Rainier Herbert Reed and Ramsden talking about all this in correspondence. Um, I'll, I'll come back to Rilke in a little bit. Um, another figure who really emerges is um, Dag Hammarskjöld, the, the Secretary, of Gen Secretary General of the United Nations. Um, the library conta contains um, a lot of books of Hammarskjöld's writings, books about him, but also a lot of books related to the United Nations news, and there are a lot of these um, United Nations news um, magazines that Hepworth seems to have, um, seems to have reg regularly got. Um, and one of the things I thought about was the fact that Hepworth famously, um, at her address for the unveiling of the UN single form, um, in New York stated that throughout my work on the single form I've kept in mind Dag Hammarskjöld's idea of human aesthetic ideology and actually when you read I read a lot of the Hammarskjöld um, it really comes across the kind of points of intersection um, in their thinking um, that these are very complementary sort of similar ideas emerge with Hammarskjöld of kind of focus on integration of the ideas of cooperation that were really um, integral to Hepworth's thinking. Um, uh, back to Zen that Stephen's already touched on and um, we've already seen this image spring um, but I just wanted to also actually give a page from uh, one of these Zen texts uh, this is the, the Alan Watts that, um, that Stephen referred to and I really think that actually seeing them against each other you really get a sense of the kind of calligraphy and just doing that, doing that visual juxtaposition um, Hepworth said that uh, there's a text, Eugene Herigel's Zen and the Art, in the Art of Archery, 1956, which she cited as one of her two favourite books, the other being Stravinsky's Poetics and Music. Um, and again, these connected with people. Um, her copy of Zen and Japanese Culture was gifted to her by Herbert Reed. Um, and obviously, we also have a lot of books in the library, and there are a lot of books in the library from Bernard Leach. And obviously, Leach was really important within the St. Ives movement um, in terms of these kind of other sort of spiritual, spirituality. Um, and we get um, also books on the Baha'i faith, which um, Bernard Leach con converted to. And um, just a quote from Herigel where he talks about closest to the feeling of Zen was a calligraphic style of painting done with black black ink on paper or silk. Um, and again, just it's really nice. Um, Greece. Um, so, and there are also a large number of books from the library devoted to the landscape and historic sites of Greece, um, including, and including some that also document um, Greek sculpture. And they're very, a lot of these are very photographic books. Um, some, are, some are color photography, some are black and white. Um, and the one book that's particularly interesting is this um, book called Lord Kinross's Portrait of Greece, which is basically a kind of photo book of kind of major Greek sites. And in that, Hepworth has put page markers next to photographs of Delphi, the page on, on, shown on the screen, Vera and Patmos, all sites that would later become titles for her sculptures. Um, and I think it's also interesting to consider the books um, from uh, the books on Greece in, in um, tandem with the sketchbook that Hepworth made um, in Greece. Um, this idea that maybe that's kind of using both the sketches she, she, she'd taken alongside these books that she was either been given or 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 actively gathering herself. Um, Again, some more, more ju ju visual juxtapositions. Um, here on the left, we have the sketchbook with drawings of Corre that she made in Greece. In the middle, we have um, Christian Zervos's um, uh, L'Art on Greece. Um, and on the right, we have, um, which is a picture of a Corre, and on the right, we have Hepler's own Corre, and I just found that really, really striking. 
striking par visual parallel between, between the three. Um, it's not just about what, what the nature of the subjects of Hepworth's books, but also what she, the notes that she made in them herself. I mean, on the whole, the library, um, the books aren't very highly annotated. Um, I think Hepworth was probably quite careful with her books. So they're all um, they're in pretty good condition without a lot. But there are a couple of um, really interesting examples where they do contain extensive notes. Um, what I have here is um, she has a number of dictionaries in her library which contain what seem to be ideas for, for titles. Um, as you can probably see, if, I'm not sure how, visu how visible this is, but um, on a number of these we, get, we can see words that become future titles, such as things like Corre, Meridian. Um, but it's also interesting to think about the kind of words that she's thinking about, um, and actually that she's turning to dictionaries at all. Um, on this, this is from the Dictionary of Science. Um, we see a lot of words that um, are connected, um, sorry, uh, connected to forms, the inner and outer form. We get things like axis, um, nucleus, um, things like rotating around a form. Um, we also have a number, there are a surprisingly number that, a large number that have that words to do with um, early English musical forms, some of which did later become titles for works. Um, and another one with just these words, such as ode, partita, galliard, pavam, all written down. And that brings me, um, what I wanted to think about looking at the library is, not just thinking about individual texts, but thinking about what the relationship between different texts were. Were there points of juxtaposition, of continuation between different texts? And one thing that really emerged um, is, is this interest in form and these, these books that deal with, deal with the subject of form, which obviously, as we know, is um, really, really vital for Hepworth. Um, and so, obviously, form was a topic with a historical um, significance in the interwar period. Um, modern biology began increasingly concerned to account for the production of form in nature, whilst a new psychology of form explain, aimed to explain the development of art and culture. Um, and several of the other texts um, owned by Hepworth, the product of this time, um, the Life of Forms by Vauquelin, which um, Stephen referred to, um, and we also have the Aspects, Aspects of Form by Lancelot Law White. Um, Hepworth would famously write to Herbert Reed of her greatest pleasure in finding the phrase, a life of forms in Vauquelin's text. Um, she says, quote, these four words seem pregnant to me of everything matters, the reality of sculpture. Um, on the subject of form, on the right-hand side, we have um, J.D. Burnell's um, The Origin of Life, um, which has this wonderful dedication um, in which he says to her, hoping to show you how forms can just arrive by themselves. Um, and on the left, we have um, a page from um, Science and Health um, by total blank, um, and at the bottom she talks about God's ideas reflecting in countless spiritual forms, and that's one of the few examples where like, the back few pages are literally all notes. Um, and I realise I, I have to come to, to an end. I was going to also, well actually I will just talk briefly about this. Um, form also single form poem of Dag Hammarskjöld's Markings, this book which famously used single form on the front cover, and also just thinking about what the relationship between form and, um, I mean, this text by Hammarskjöld was a kind of spiritual meditation. The fact that, Hamish, that they chose to use, use that image of, of single form on the front cover um, what kind of lines of interpretation that, that kind of offers. Um, the little known fact that the single form actually in its circle had the um, dedication to the glory of God. Um, I also, just rattling through these, um, this is where Rilke comes back in, sonnets to Orpheus, the Orpheus sculptures that Hepworth is making at the time. Um, and... The, I've noticed this, the formal similarity with a work um, such as Cantate Domino and these, ascend, these are physically ascending forms. We were talking about, about that yesterday. Um, and 
My final thing, as I just wanted to note, was also, what, interestingly, that the library also contains um, a lot of examples. Hepworth seemed to gather any text in which her sculpture was either written about or reproduced. And we get some, not just exhibition catalogues, but we get some quite interesting, maybe more unusual um, examples of where, where her, her, her work is shown. This is um, a projective geometry by Oliver Wisher, um, which included a feature where, they, where he was exploring the influence of modern geome geometry on modern artists. So Hepworth reproduced in a book about geometry. And finally, um, Jellicoe's studies in landscape design, um, in which he talked about the relevance of Hepworth's drawings to the landscape architect. And I just wanted to leave that on the question of what such um, use, uses and reproduction of Hepworth's work that, oh, not just the, <laughs> sorry. Um, then the wider question, um, oh, this has come out, um, of the presentation of Hepworth's work in print and the kind of interdisciplinary value it seemed to offer. Um, and that, at that point, I will, I will finish.